I was very lucky to get um, a chance to see the film. Um, it's really good. I I haven't seen anything like it for a, for a long time. Um, so my first question is obviously um, the film seems to be part revisionist western, but but for a completely different reason. Um, it's got a lot of classic stuff in there in terms of reference to westerns. So uh, from your point of view, what, what were the first conversations you had with James? Uh, what did they focus on with regards to the, the film when it came to editing? Yeah, he, he, he sort of wanted, he, he said to me, um, you know, when Leone came out with uh, A Fistful of Dollars, I think that was the first Leone Western. Mm. It was as though he had never seen a Western before, which is not entirely true. You know, he, he's, he's making a lot of references to classic Westerns, but mm. he wanted to reinvent the genre a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, and he said that this was a Western for people who love Westerns, but also people who don't love Westerns and don't normally go to Westerns. So yeah. well, although those movies were useful to us, you know, we looked at, I looked at Leone for the interplay with music and, and story and sound, particularly, mm. and, you know, peck and par for um, some of the more kind of violent sequences and cross-cutting and mm. intercutting slow-mos and stuff like that. And, um, and I know that the, the sort of big sky westerns like um, The Searchers and, and whatnot were definitely ascetic um, mm. touchstones for him in the shooting, mm. but we didn't necessarily prioritise westerns when we were making the movie. We talked, you know, we talked about all kinds of movies. Mm. Um, so, you know, for example, um, Smoke, the um, Wayne Wang movie from the 90s, like a little indie movie. That was a touchstone for us when we were cutting some of the stories. Mm. There's a couple of scenes in the movie where the character, the Regina King's character, Trudy, or, or Idris Elba's character, mm. um, Rufus, tell a story. Um, and with Idris's story at the end of the film, very mm. important story, <laughs> we had actually shot um, flashback material to illustrate that. Yeah. But we found that um, the moment I got his performance and I really didn't want to cut away. I didn't want to cut away to anything but Jonathan to Nat Love listening to the story because obviously mm. his response and where he... Because it's pivotal, yeah, sure. Without giving too much away. No, um, no. <laughs> no. What, he under, what he understands when is very important. Mm. But in terms of, um, of staying with the character, just telling the story, um, that was kind of a you know, it was a bold decision to make, but we went back and looked at Smoke because I had this memory of, of them having used flashbacks and Smoke to tell the story or dramatizations, the, the story that Harvey Keitel was telling John Hurt. Yeah. Um, and when I went back and looked at it, there was no such thing. It was just Harvey, mostly just Harvey Keitel telling the story, a couple of cutaways to, mm. to John Hurt listening. Uh, or is it William Hurt? I can I get my Hurts. I think up. it's William Hurt. Uh, it's William Hurt. Yeah, it's, it's um, cool. They're, they're easily confused. <laughs> um, you know, it, I, I guess the point being that uh, as a viewer, I had filled in the gaps and I had mm. made up the, you know, so it really seemed like I had seen the story that was being told, but it's really in the power of the storytelling and the storyteller. Absolutely. Um, um, you've, got... you've, you've covered off a couple of my questions because obviously I, I was going to, mention his background in music and obviously he's made music he's made yeah. albums and so on and so forth and this isn't his first film um and you've obviously covered the the fact that his musical background makes the film very dynamic and, and it right. gives it a certain it gives it a certain cadence and it gives it a certain momentum all the way through and it it dictates things pretty much um i was gonna say as an editor uh, how important do you think it uh, symbolism in the film was in, in establishing a rhythm within the scenes, if that makes sense to you. Symbolism? like a, Symbolism, a like um, you've, you've got um, uh, you've got the ring with, uh, again, it's about not giving too much away. You've got mm -hmm. the, the ring which yeah. he wears around his neck, which you cut mm -hmm. to certain things during yes. the film, which are, are very very subtle and, and they, the they, ring was they, a really... they add emphasis Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, the ring is a particularly interesting one because we didn't have that originally. Uh, mm -hmm. We shot a couple of inserts of the ring for pickups and and, uh, and and a couple of places we had the material, but we hadn't used it. Mm -hmm. um, so 
what we found in cutting the film was um, we needed to give some hints at where it was going, even yeah. though you can't reveal what the true story is until the end of the movie. Mm. We had to kind of indicate that um, Rufus, Idris Elba's character, had a purpose. Yeah, and, sure. And so little, little things like the ring mm. gave you some indication that he was masterminding this kind of collision course that the two characters mm. Ron, even if you don't understand necessarily the full significance of it, mm. you see that Rufus takes the ring. You know the ring is important to Nat because it's his mother's ring. Mm. Um, he also uses it to propose to Mary. So mm. it's it's doubly important. Um, you don't realize the significance it might have to Rufus as a character. Mm. Um, but those kind of things we hope will be really rewarding on a second viewing. And you've, um, you've got there's there's another scene where they're having a standoff um that there's there's a, a sort of a a standoff between two gunfighters and you've got this overhead shot and it's an overhead shot oh, yes. with the, you know the one i mean with the silhouettes i love that shot yeah and I it's love just that like and and, and it, what, what i mean by symbolism is without getting a bit film critique about it, it is that it feeds back into the old westerns you know, so you've got, mm. you can look at it from, this is the, James's take on the new West and the guys there. And then you've got the old West and within the silhouettes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's sort I'm of layered in there. there. I mean, well, no, I think it's all in there. I mean, the, the interesting thing about James is he has seen everything. So it's all in his head. How much of it is, um, is deliberate, even between the two of us, is, is hard to say. I mean, that, yeah. that overhead shot of the silhouettes was, I think, a B cam that was up on, um, was up on some kind of crane rig for the whole scene. Yeah. Um, but I found that moment where the um, where the silhouettes actually played stronger than the faces, which is very unusual. But the body language was so big from the kid. Um, yeah. I think he's saying you sure do know how to make a grand entrance and gesturing with his hands and it just seemed like a beautiful moment to to go to that overhead shot I don't know that it was any deeper than that on my behalf at that point in time yeah they're just certain shots that grab you when you're in the cutting room and yeah these guys shot a lot right yeah and they were always running a b camera so like another shot might be um the reflection of the Keith Stanfield and and the gun there's a split screen sequence and yep, um, he's talking through the door to the, mm -hmm. the general. And that was something that I missed on my first pass through the dailies. Yeah. And then going back through, you know, like the 30 minutes of, um, of the B cam just following this gun, I found there was mm -hmm. a moment where it, he, he kind of popped into focus in the reflection yep. of the gun. Little things like that that you just kind of pick up on. And it did feel very kind of classic Western slash maybe new Western, spaghetti Western era. Because I, I was um, I was going to say that you've got obviously the as you said you have the example of the split screen, and then you have I, I didn't know how to describe it in the question you have like drop down comic book panels, Do you know yes, yes. Do you know what I'm yeah and you you see so you've got that but you've also got the use of point of view so POV shot there's one specific POV shot which is really integral. Um, I was going to ask how do you, how did you you pretty much answered the question, but if you want to go elaborate slightly more, you can do. Um, how that impacted your editing technique, how the scene or whatever. Um, the, the POV shot, are you talking yeah. about the one where Rufus comes mm -hmm. into the jail? Yeah, I and mean, he actually very... he doesn't see him and he, he doesn't look up until, yes. yeah, it's really clever. What? I mean, there are a number of really interesting things about that to me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one is that James had decided that those two characters were not going to share a frame until yeah. the end of the movie so you That's see cool. them both walk into profile together mm. at the end of the movie but uh, up until that time um they never share a frame mm. and we actually got notes from the studio saying why you know why did they not um <laughs> you know can, can we put them it looks like we shot them in two different places can we put them in, a, in, in the scene together and, yeah and james was quite firm you know that no that they don't come face to face literally uh in the same shot until the end of the movie mm. um but the other interesting thing about that POV was that scene was not originally the scene in which the two men meet as, as adults. Okay. Um, it was scripted to be the previous scene mm. out in the street where Nat rides into town, mm. Mary's thrown down in the dirt and mm. they have this face off and they were supposed to have a face off there. But because of COVID, they had like a, a false positive and they had to shut down the set that day. Oh my God, it yeah. was Idris's last day. Oh God. Um, so then he disappeared. Um, right. 
meanwhile, I knew none of this. I was editing the film at that stage back in New Zealand, and I was looking at that jail scene, and I thought, this is actually a better, to me, a better entrance for Idris into the, you were awful yeah. for the two men to meet. That I saw that beautiful POV shot that you're talking about, the steady cam yeah. shot, the page shot. Um, and then I had this idea, I got John, my first assistant, to mm. um, add some whistling. And so it originally was John, now it's actually James's voice in the movie, whistling the theme that Nat sings to Mary. And again, mm. without giving too much away, mm. we just want to put the question in people's head, how does, it, how does Rufus know that same song? Mm. Um, so that was a really interesting moment. And, and I got on the phone to James and he said, look, there's terrible things happen. We've shut down, we've had to shut down, we've lost interest, but he seemed oddly unperturbed. And he, he said to me, I think this jail scene is gonna be a much better place for those two people to, to meet. Yeah, sure. And so then I played, him, I played him the scene with the whistling on it and he was, was overjoyed. Yeah. Um, so that was a great, but you know, none of the, the, the stuff isn't necessarily um, um, premeditated. No, well, it, it, it find, can't be. Find in the there, edit. There's so much that there's so much variation and, and, and so much invention within the film as a whole that you, you yeah. there's no way you could pre-plan. You couldn't do you couldn't do no, it. No, and you can't plan for, for COVID and, and stuff like no. that. So so happy accidents were actually really useful to us in some ways. Um, another place that helped us, I think, was in the bar scene where Nat and Mary meet. Mm. Um, and she's singing. Um, yeah. And we couldn't, we weren't allowed to have a bunch of extras, you know, so we couldn't have a lot of people in there. Mm. Um, we later went in and filled some in with the effects, but they had to figure out a way of shooting it that mm. didn't show that the bar was empty. So they came up with these super tight close ups. And when mm. I saw those in the dailies, I thought, this is amazing. So I used them for the second half of the scene. Like once Mary has seen that, although they're on opposite sides of the room and she's singing, she's performing for the crowd. It's it's but really, really it's a very intimate scene between the two mm. of them. Um, and again, you've got so the, butt was, of, the butt of the rifle on the on the on, on the floor, which yes, well, all yeah. of that was very premeditated. And I think James had told me he wanted to, you know, be very kind of rhythmic with it. So all it's the cutting quite, is very cool, square. It? Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I was going to say um, I, I had a thing about uh, moments of intimacy. And again, it was more about, about an editing choice um, because there isn't, there's a lot of violence and it's essentially, it's a retribution story or, on the mm. surface at least. Um, so getting moments, character moments in there must be down to the editing. And there's specifically, there's, there's an example of, um, of Rufus and Trudy when she does his cufflink, right. which, it, yeah. which is, which is a, my, my example that I just picked up on. Um, so from your point of view, were there any other yes. examples which I might Yeah, um, I mean, you've, you've really hit on it. it. It was a challenge to keep the story kind of intimate and make sure mm. that you cared about the characters and it wasn't just the violent kind of retribution yeah, sure. story. Um, so we had to put extra time sometimes into some of those interactions. Um, mm. There's another one between Mary and Nat where she rejoins him. The, the whole gang rejoins him on his mission. Mm. And she hands off the the reins of the horse to him, and we had to carve out space for that. Right. Okay. Likewise, the, the scene that you've just mentioned between Trudy and, and Rufus, um, those scenes, a lot of those scenes had targets on their back because they don't, you don't strictly speaking, need them to understand the narrative. The narrative would still move forward. Oh, ab absolutely. But, them. but they do, they do. But, but yeah, and it's it's a big but as well. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, to, to it was important to show, it get, definitely gave dimension to Idris's character to show um, Trudy's loyalty and mm. the kind of intimacy between them. And although you don't understand necessarily exactly what he's up to, mm. you kind of understand that he um, has this kind of magnetism and, and that um, she at least is a true believer. Yeah. Um, you know, so he has this, um, incredible pull on people and it also was good to give her her character time as well so which is why we gave her a, a scene later on there's a um scene in the jail between her and mary mm. um, when she's peeling an apple and telling a story and again strictly 
we don't need that scene. We could take it out, but it tells us a lot about Trudy mm. and who she is. Mm. And it really feeds into the feud between the two women, especially mm. given the way that that story ends. It's, it mm. seems like they've reached this kind of compassionate understanding. Mm. And then Trudy has her strangled just for the hell of it. <laughs> you know, so that, and that really pays off when the two women meet at the end of the film and have mm. this, um, you know, drag down fight. Exactly. I have I have two more questions and I'll leave you in peace. One's really easy. Um, obviously, you've worked with Taika a lot, um, yeah. and which obviously culminated in the Oscar nomination for Jojo Rabbit, which, again, belated con um, congratulations. Great a, a <laughs> film. Great film. Really clever again. Um, what would you say, have obviously, now working with James, they, they're, they're very unique filmmakers. So... What they, they differences are, yeah. or what similarities do you think they share? Uh, I mean, it's tricky. They're, they're very different humans. The <laughs> yes. way that they, yes. the way that they work, has actually got some similarities. They both like to give an editor space. Mm. So, um, you know, on this movie, James was happy to give me a couple of weeks to get the film together before he came in, and mm. he kind of encouraged me to you know, cut some of the scenes that we both kind of knew were, were not going to make it. And he always encouraged me to to be bold mm. and to kind of, um, you know, make odd stylistic choices. Mm. And um, and he was always happy to kind of give you a bit of rope to, to do that. Yeah. You know? um, so it was, we were never in a situation, he always said to me, he didn't want to breathe down my neck, you know, so he would come in every couple of days and mm. we would screen stuff and he, he would talk and he's a great storyteller so his mm. mode of direction is telling stories which mm. is a very fun way to receive direction because it's not too didactic so he'll just tell you a story and at the end of the story there's some kind of moral that that relates back to whatever it is that you're cutting but it's not mm. like you know take two frames off here and, <laughs> and three there and um, yeah absolutely yeah so they have some similarities in that regard um uh, I think they both walk a line tonally. I mean, Jojo definitely was a big tightrope walk, but this this one as well takes in a lot of different tones. It can be funny at times, mm. but it's also very sincere and also very mm. stylized. And mm. we had to throw out the dichotomy between style and substance. So mm. in this movie, in The Heart of They Fall, style is part of the substance. It's definitely mm. part of who James is. Yeah. You know? um, and if we took the style out, it, it, it seemed like the it was a less soulful film and the, yeah. the, the substance, the story would actually suffer for that. So it, that was an interesting balancing act. Mm. Um, beyond that, it's, it's hard. I'm so close to both of them. It's, it's sort of hard to, to compare and con mm. contrast, but both very, very fun people to work with. Well, I, 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 uh, I sat down with my family and I watched Jojo Rabbit. I'd seen it previously. Um, and my, my daughter got, she she got ten minutes into it and 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 she walked out. She left the oh. room because uh, and I, I I understand why, and a lot of people hopefully do because it, it is it is quite a challenging film. But then after obviously after fifteen minutes, it become you get it. It makes sense. Um, so yeah, but but going back to um, the holiday fall, it's it's really clever. I mean, I watched it today purely in preparation to this interview with you. So I looked at the right. editing as, as much as I could from my perspective. Um, and I'll go back and I'll look at it again to review it. Um, yeah. My, well, I hope you get a chance to see it at a cinema as well, if you do. Well, take that absolutely. Chance, it's, it's, obviously, it's opening the, the London Film Festival. So yes, absolutely. I'm, I have one there. final question, completely off topic. Can you describe for me your perfect Sunday afternoon? Oh, man. Um, just hanging out with my family, I guess. Any anytime we can be together, mm. I'm pretty lazy. So, like, uh, by the <laughs> beach or by the pool would be good good for me. And maybe watching a movie together. Um, my son's about five, so we've started watching. You know, he watches a lot of Pixar stuff, but also mm. um, we've started watching some of my old favourites. So he, he will watch Star Wars or E.T. with me as a yeah. personal favour. Okay. So um, that's a really fun process. Thank <laughs> you.